Amen. You may be seated. Would you take your copy of God's Word and join me in the book of Joshua, the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 7. And if you'll find verse 1, we'll begin there in a few moments. In our walk with God, we can learn from those who have gone before us. Uh, We can learn from pastors, missionaries, evangelists, other people that have walked with God and we see what uh, God has done in their lives and we can learn from that, uh, from those who have gone before. Uh, Charles Stanley is a pastor, historic pastor of the First Baptist Church of Atlanta. He went to be home with the Lord last Monday. I also think of Billy Graham when I think of that statement. And I also think of a personal mentor of mine who went to be home with the Lord uh, a couple years ago, uh, Jimmy Pritchard. And so there's these men and women that have walked with God, and you can learn a great deal uh, about them, uh, their biographies. They have uh, impressive biographies, and we can learn from their victories. We learn from their defeats. But you can learn a great deal from those who have walked before you and who have walked with God, and we can take that and apply those principles into our own life. Young people can learn that and should learn that from their parents. Their parents have gone before them, and young people can look to their parents and should be able to look to their parents and learn uh, how they have uh, walked with God and principles that that, uh, can be taught and applied from their lives. Younger siblings can learn from older siblings. In fact, uh, I was an older sibling, and for my younger brother, all he had to do was look at my life, and he could have learned a great deal of what not to do and learned what to avoid. Um, Younger siblings can learn from their older siblings. Young people can learn from their parents, teachers at church, leaders at church, uh, those who have gone before, we can learn from them. Well, the Bible is filled with people, men and women, who have gone before us. Uh, They call it the great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us, and we can learn from their lives from the Bible. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he writes a letter to the church in Corinth, and he starts listing out some things that have happened in the Old Testament. And speaking about that, those who have gone before us in the Old Testament, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11 and 12 says this, Now all these things happened to them, as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall so i.e if you think you don't need examples from those who have gone before you then you are missing a great warning in fact that's a great pitfall for you if you think you can't learn from those who have walked with god and have already gone before you He says we can look to the Old Testament. We can look into our own lives. Those who have gone before us, we need their examples. We can learn from their examples. And uh, this morning, there's a great example for us today by the man of Joshua. And he has a great bio. If you think of his biography, I mean, this man was challenged with the task of following in the footsteps of a great leader named Moses. Now, that's a tall order if you're Joshua. But you know what? God placed him right next door to a man who had already gone before him. Moses, he had a front row seat. And some things he could have learned from things that he should do. And there are a few things. You could go into Moses' life and Joshua had a front row seat. And the example was, hey, don't do that when when it's your turn in leadership. And so he got a front row seat to someone who had gone before, who had walked in the very same leadership assignment that that he was about to go in. God had given him an example that had gone before him. And Joshua, he needed to be encouraged. He needed to be strengthened over and over again. When you look at his life, man, the, the admonition to him is be strong, be courageous. I am with you. And so he needed to hear that because, uh, like we all do, uh, there are some things before us that are just too much for us to do. But Joshua could learn from the example that went before him. And so we find ourselves in Joshua chapter 7. 
And uh, we are going to look at two events in Joshua's life. And these two events, man, we can learn from a man who has gone before us. And there are things that we could apply to our own life. We're going to look at two events. One, the first event is going to come in Joshua 7. The second event is going to come in Joshua chapter 9. And just kind of take a small note of this. Both of these events come right after two enormous victories. Two enormous victories. And then we're going to get a glimpse into what we can learn into our own lives from someone who has gone before us. The first victory was the victory of Jericho. The second victory was the victory of Ai. And uh, we're going to look and see what we can learn right after uh, those two victories. The title of the message this morning is Ancient Pitfalls for the Present Age. Ancient Pitfalls for the Present Age. So let's look at the first event. You got Joshua chapter 7 ready to go? Let's look at verse 1. This is going to be the background information, okay? So when I say background information, this is information Joshua does not have, but that God has and you as the reader of the Bible have, okay? And so we're going to get this glimpse into Joshua 7 verse 1, the background. It says, but the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now this immediately follows a great victory in Jericho. And so Joshua doesn't know this yet. This is it. This is you as the reader getting this information. And so all they know is that they have followed some kind of crazy instructions, okay? And the instructions kind of didn't line up with your typical military strategy to overtake Jericho. Jericho, the instructions were no one's going to really talk or say a word. You're going to march around the city one time every day for six days. On the seventh day, you're going to march around seven times, shout as loud as you can. Can you imagine how loud that would have been? Like a million people doing this. And then you're going to blow trumpets at the same time. I bet they were freaked out before the walls even fell down. And then they come in and they take Jericho. Now, Joshua is a bloody book, okay? And you just need to know that when you're reading it. And so Bible critics love to kind of attack this. But there's a couple things going on in, the, in this book of Joshua. The first thing is God is fulfilling his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he is going to give their children the land of promise, the promised land, the land of Israel, where Israel is at today. The second thing is, there are nations there who had plenty of time to repent, but that time has passed. In fact, they are so evil, you can look at historical documents that will make Sodom and Gomorrah look like a wonderful place to live. And so, there are two things happening. God has given the children of Israel the land of promise, and at the same time, they are his instruments of judgment on a land who is beyond past repentance, okay? And so, Jericho is the very first battle as you cross the Jordan. It's right next to the Jordan. They cross. And so what you have here is the principle of first fruits. The first fruits in the Bible, you go all the way back to Adam and Eve and what they taught their children, and it still runs today. The first fruits belong to God. They are his. And so this first battle, they, no spoil is going to go to the children. In an army, typically what you get, you get the spoil from the victory. But God had told them, this spoil is mine, this battle is mine, you go into Jericho and you take none of this stuff and you leave it. In fact, there's going to be a curse, Josh pronounce, Joshua pronounces that curse is a man who, who rebuilds this place. And uh, in the ministry of King Ahab, his kingship, it was so bad that someone thought that that would be a good idea and that curse fell upon them and they cost their two sons. And so... The battle, the first fruits, that's an important principle for you to get. And so the principle uh, was actually given in Joshua 6, verses 18 and 19. All of Israel knew this. There was a great warning. Joshua 6, verse 18 says, And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse. And trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So, do you see what makes it accursed? 
All this stuff belongs to God, and so if you take it, you are robbing God of things that belong to him. The very first fruits, this battle. And so this, all the silver and gold and stuff that you see, we're going to put that in the temple. And so it's a curse because it's devoted. It's consecrated. You'd be taking something that doesn't belong to you. In fact, if you think this doesn't happen today, it still happens today with the principle of first fruits. When those withhold their tithe, that which belongs to God that should go into his treasury, people withhold that and they still rob God even today. This principle of the first fruits, it's seen in this battle. Uh, it's devoted, it's set apart to God. But unbeknownst to Joshua, someone has taken it. A man by the name of Achan has gone in and through this battle, somewhere along the way, he spots some gold, a Babylonian garment. We'll, we're going to get into that in a moment. And he sees some stuff, and he takes it. But nobody, nobody knows. Nobody knows this. So you got the background information down. And so uh, Joshua has no idea that this has happened. So here's what Joshua does know. We're going to get into the observable information. Look with me in verse 2. It says this, Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth-Avon, on the east side of Bethel. And he spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shabiram and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Now, this was a huge shock to them. And so the observable information they have, here's what they do. They send the men to Ai. Ai is a very small city right next door to Jericho. They're the ones next in line. Okay, we, we got the battle of Jericho. So they are following human reasoning. This is where God wants us to go, go here. And that, as they have done before, as Joshua saw in his own leadership, he was one of the spies that spied out the land of Canaan. He was one that was sent by Moses. And so he's doing things that seem like this is what you should do. And so far, this, he's exactly right. So he sends men in there, and the men come back, and they say, look, this is a no-brainer, Joshua. This is all we need to do. We need to just send a few people, just a few thousand. This city is small, especially after what happened at Jericho. Look, we'll go in, we'll take over this city, and we will be about our business. And so they left with a heart full of pride, and, but you see, they return with what? Hearts melted like water, humbled and humiliated. What happened? Well, there was some background information. They had no idea. And what you have here is Joshua relying upon human opinion alone. Did you know that's an ancient pitfall for our present age even today? Let me just walk us through some lessons from this example that we can pull from our own lives. He relies upon human opinion. He looks at the situation and says, this looks like it's easy, it's a no-brainer, and so there's no consultation with God. In fact, when does Joshua pray in there? Do you see him pray at all? You know where he prays? He prays after the fact. Look at verse 6. Then Joshua tore his clothes, fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said to God, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off your, our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? Here's an ancient pitfall. You pray after a situation's over. 
and not beforehand. Have you ever been there? It's, an, it's this pitfall that's still around today. We will live our lives based on human reasoning alone. We will live our lives based on what is right in our own eyes. And we look and we use our brains and we think this seems reasonable. This is human logic and this seems good. In fact, someone else comes along and says, yes, what you are seeing is correct. And they are relying upon their own human perspective. And so you take that advice, you run forward. That is an ancient pitfall that Satan, it's a scheme of the devil that he still uses today. And people in our present age fall into it all the time. Have you been there? My hand's up. And we can learn a great lesson. And what Joshua is learning as well, you can't move forward if there is sin in your life or in the camp of God. If it's gone unaddressed, you can try to move forward, but you go without the presence and blessing of Almighty God. In fact, this is what God tells Joshua. Look at verse 10. So the Lord said to Joshua, <clears throat> Get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned. Doesn't, you notice it doesn't just say Achan sinned? Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived. And they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore, look at this principle. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they have become doomed to destruction. And neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed things. Joshua is learning a lesson that you and I still need to learn today. If there is unaddressed sin in our midst, in our own lives, and you are going to still try to move forward, that will hinder you. That will hinder God's blessing on your life. That hinders God fighting battles. Not that he can't fight your battles. It's that he won't fight your battles. And so he departs from Israel. And so, in fact, if you go back in this book, and even in Exodus, the nations all around them, especially in the land of Canaan, it says their hearts were melted like water. Rahab tells the spies, our hearts are melted like water. So the things that the nations were experiencing, now children of Israel are experiencing. Because God said, I'm not going to go with you until this is dealt with. You see us in the New Testament. Listen to Hebrews 12.1. Therefore we also, church, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You cannot move forward if you're being weighed down with sin, and it will weigh you down. It hinders victories in your life. It hinders what God wants to do in your life. And Satan, it's a scheme of Satan to get us in this pitfall so that we become ineffective for the Lord and moving forward in our spiritual growth and in our walk with Jesus Christ. Another lesson, this one's learned by Achan. Achan learned a great lesson. And the lesson that he learned is, although nobody else knows and nobody else sees what I've done, God sees through it all. In fact, look at verse 19 of chapter 7. Joshua speaks to Achan. Now, there's a long process here, by the way, that gets singled out. And you think, why would this long process be to get down through all these clans and narrow down on Achan? Well, he should have been shuddering by this point. In fact, he should have already been confessing, but he doesn't. Now, Joshua says to Achan, my son, I beg you. Give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him. See, they got to pull it out of him. He wasn't willing. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent, 
brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. Here is a lesson for us all today that we can look and learn from Achan. Did you hear that word hidden come up quite a bit? He took it and where do you, he hid it in his tent. But if he'd gone in his tent, it was hidden even deeper. He dug a hole and now he had covered that up and now it's in the heart of the earth. You think who's going to see that? God, the God who sees, who sees it all, who's nothing hidden from his sight. And you see what ends up happening? What was hidden in the earth, now they bring it out before the Lord. There is nothing hidden in God's sight. And if he's got to get to you to this point, he will drag this sin that you think is hidden and he will bring it out to the light. I don't care how many text messages you've deleted. I don't care how much stuff you've deleted off your browsing history. I don't care what you have done and you think no one is going to find this and I'm not going to get this out before the Lord myself. He will come and he will bring it out and it will be before everyone. What's hidden in the darkness is light to God and he brings it out. And we can also learn this principle from the consequences he faces. Look at the consequences that he goes through in verse 24. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons. Listen to this list. His sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had. That's a good summary. And they brought them to the valley of Accor. And Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. Literally the Valley of Trouble. And now some people read this and they think, well, that's a little harsh. That's a little severe. And look, those consequences are very severe, no doubt. But let me just kind of retrace some things that we know from this story. A warning was issued that this would happen to you if you were going to go ahead and do this. He, uh, he doesn't listen to the warning. He doesn't, you know, he thinks he stands and so he puts himself in the position to fall and then he goes in and he, you hear the word covet? He covets something that doesn't belong to him. Now all of a sudden the 10th commandment is more severe than you and I really thought it was. And so he then takes this stuff and he brings trouble upon Israel. 36 men lost their life because of this man's covetousness. Those men had families. Those men had wives, daughters, sons stuff and so set Aiken he thinks that you know what's the big deal and here's a lesson for us today don't ever take your own sin lightly with God and typically we take it lightly before the consequences arrive but once the consequences ensue that's when we realize oh what we did was a big deal let me just put it to you this way. No one thinks, maybe, you know, maybe I'll, I'll cheat a little bit on my taxes. What's the big deal? But then the IRS shows up, and they start taking your stuff, and you start losing all that you have. Oh, now all of a sudden it's a big deal, right? It's once the consequences come, that's when we realize, oh, that was a big deal. Oh, I'll covet my neighbor's wife in the Tenth Commandment. What's the big deal? Well, when you lose all that you have, your family, your house, and you see your wife and children walk out the door, it, when those consequences come on you, now you realize, don't you? Once the consequences ensue, oh, it, that, that, I guess that really was a big deal. Or I'll covet my neighbor's stuff. I will, whatever, I will neglect my walk with God. What's the big deal with that? It's a few Bible studies here and there. Prayer, Bible study. I'll, you know, fellowshipping with the family is it really that big of a deal to actually be here on a Sunday morning what's, what's the big deal and then someone slowly turns their back on God and they start walking away from God and then the consequences they reap that in their own life and then all of a sudden 
it's then you realize, oh, I guess those things are a big deal. We never realize it on the front end. We realize it typically on the back end. But if you realize it at this point, then you know what? It's too late. Realize it today. This is an ancient pitfall still before us today. Sin is a serious deal in the eyes of God. And for us to think lightly of it, for us to think it's no big deal, we are setting us, ourselves up to fall in this ancient pitfall. Remember that admonition from the beginning? Lest he who thinks he stands take heed. Why? Lest he fall. They are still among us today. Do not take your own sin lightly like it's not a big deal. Deal with it. Address it. Get it in the light before God. If you need to go to another spiritual leader, a godly man, a godly woman, if you, whatever you need to do, deal with it. Address that. It is a big deal. They address this, and you know what happens? They move forward again. They lay down some weight, and you know what happened? God actually had a strategic plan for AI. AI. Even that small little town that thought, oh, what, what does God want to do here? In fact, if you keep on reading, we're not, for the sake of time, they go up and there's a strategic military tactic God wanted to use in an ambush and they actually come up and they have this strategic military thing and there were specific instructions for that assignment, but they had no idea. You know why? Because they did not ask him. God has all the background information that you need for your life if we'll simply go to him and ask him for it. Don't neglect your time with God. All the little stuff in your life, you know what? The little AIs in your life, they matter. The little AIs for our church, they matter. We need to talk to God, not about some things, about everything. He has instructions for our life. And you need to walk around thinking, oh, this is a no-brainer, that's a no-brainer. You need to take a serious warning today, lest you fall. These are pitfalls still among us. So they go, they follow specific assignments. You know what God does? He fights for Israel again. They conquer AI. They throw up that way. God is fighting for his people again, and they're off moving forward. Huge victory. So now they all got it, right? Big victory. You think Satan's going to let that go? Absolutely not. Right after that victory, we're going to see another scheme of Satan that's going to rise to the forefront. And it's an ancient pitfall for them. But it's, it's an example for our present age as well. Are y'all ready for the second event? We got past the first one. I need to probably hit this one maybe a little quicker. But hang in there because this is, this is so much for our life. Let's look at the background information again. All right, so again, they don't know this. This is background information that God has. But you and I, the reader, we get privileged too. Look at verse 1 of Joshua chapter 9. Make your way to Joshua 9. Let's look at verse 1, the second event. It says, It came to pass when all the kings were on this side of the Jordan, in the hills and in the lowland, and all the coasts of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, you need to pay attention to this name right here, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, they hear about it. And it says that they gathered together to fight with Joshua and Israel with one accord. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they worked craftily, and they went and pretended to be ambassadors. And they took old sacks on their donkeys, old wineskins torn and mended, old and patched sandals on their feet, and old garments on themselves, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua to the camp at Gilgal and said to him, to the men of Israel, We have come from a far country. Now, therefore, make a covenant with us. Now, this background information gives us a lot, doesn't it? Joshua, they, all they know is they are being told this people is coming from a far land. But you and I get the background information. Where are they from? A place called Gibeon. Gibeon is the next in line to Ai. So if you go, you've got Jericho, Ai, and then just to the southwest, just a few miles, is a place called Gibeon. It's actually a large city, a lot of mighty warriors there. But they see the handwriting on the wall. God's fame is spreading. This people, I man, they're, they're scared to death of. And although they're, they could come to a fight, their hearts have melted like water. And so they're like, what are we going to do? And they come up with this plan. Hey, 
We will pretend, we'll work craftily. And the way they worked craftily is this. We're going to take some wineskins that are all busted up. We'll patch them up and we'll make them look like we've been traveling for a long time. We'll take old sandals. Everybody get your oldest sandal in your closet and bring it with you. Get your dry and moldy bread. And we're going to fool these people. We are going to make them think we have been traveling for a long, long way. So that we will tr trick the children of Israel to making a peace treaty with us. And once they make this peace treaty, there's nothing they can do to us. Thus, we are saved. That is their plan. That's the way they worked craftily. Okay, So that's background information. Joshua doesn't know this. Let's look at the observable information. Look at verse 7. It says, Then the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Look, they are speaking to people that are their neighbors that they don't know it. Perhaps you dwell among us, so how can we make a covenant with you? Here, this is, this is important. Joshua says, look, you, what if you're, he's thinking right. Well, what if you're, what if you're actually our neighbor? We, we can't make a peace treaty with our neighbor. That's a, what's what we've been told not to do. Joshua, at this point, he's actually following the Bible. In fact, let me read to you Exodus 23. This is what Joshua knows. And I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the Sea Felicia and from the desert to the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. They were told up front, you do not make a covenant peace treaty with anybody. My judgment is coming. The time of repentance is past. You're going to come in, and then you are going to execute my judgment. I am giving you the land. You are not to make a peace treaty with a neighbor. There's actually another section of Scripture that says you can make a peace treaty with someone far away, but you cannot make it with a neighbor. And so Joshua, that's why he's asking, well, what if you're... Among us, well, the peace treaty's off the table. So he's trying to do the right thing. He knows the Bible. He's trying to even apply the Bible to his own life. And it illustrates the scheme of Satan for us to deceive the people of God and to disobeying what they know they shouldn't do. And so he's doing his best interrogative work. Watch verse 8. They said to Joshua, we are your servants. And Joshua said to them, who are you and where do you come from? So he's interrogating. Well, I've got to figure this out. So they said to him, from a very far country your servants have come. Because of the name of the Lord your God, for we have heard of his fame and all that he did in Egypt. Look, this is where it gets tricky for Joshua. And all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who are beyond the Jordan. To Sion, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who was at Ashtoreth. Therefore, our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, and here's what they said. Take provisions with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say to them, We are your servants. Now, therefore, make a covenant with us. This bread of ours we took hot for our provision from our houses on the day we departed to come to you. But now, look, it is dry and moldy. And these wineskins which we filled were new, and see, they are torn. And these our garments and our sandals have become old because of the very long journey. You see how he's getting duped? He's being told the right stuff. He looks right. But here's where I think it gets really tricky for Joshua. They start speaking good about his God. We've heard of the fame of your God. Man, he's awesome. He's mighty. Man, everybody knows that. Oh, let me rehearse those victories y'all had. Remember what you did to Sihon and Og, the king, those kings, and what you did on the other. We know about all that. And so now Joshua, man, he is like, all right, maybe this is from God. Maybe they are from him. And here we have an ancient pitfall that Satan still does today. He mixes truth with lies to get you to think, oh, yes, this is okay. And then we go, oh, maybe it's from God, and then we end up disobeying God. Satan, we don't need to be ignorant of his scheme. That's what he does. When you might say, preacher, well, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to even know? That doesn't seem fair. Look at verse 14. The men of Israel took some of their provisions, but what? But they did not ask counsel of the Lord. Can I give some lessons from the example? We should not be so foolish that we can't fall for the same scheme twice. 
Two times back to back he falls into this. Yes, Joshua has, man, they conquer over 30 kingdoms. I mean, they do incredible work. And there's a lot to be learned from being brave and to walk out and step out in faith. But here we can also learn from this example from the gone from before us, these pitfalls are still around. And it catches men and women who think, I don't need to ask God about anything. I don't want to trouble God with these things. I can move forward on my own. You are not sufficient enough for you. You don't have wisdom. You don't have background information that he has. You need the counsel of Almighty God. And it says they did not ask counsel of the Lord. Literally in the Hebrew, it says the mouth of the Lord. God, in both cases, had they have gone. The Bible seems to indicate that God would reveal background information if we'll ask for it. We go to his mouth and his counsel. And I'm telling you, there is a difference from what comes out of God's mouth than what comes out of Satan's mouth. What comes out of Satan's mouth, it might sound good, it might look good, but if we take the bait, there is a hook there, there's something nasty there, and there are consequences for that there. Lessons from the example. Anytime you think you can stand, what? You will fall. God will bring out the background information. You know what we're required to do? New Testament, Jesus makes this plain. What do we, we ask We seek, we knock, and what? It will be open to us. He who asks, it will be received. It will be given. He wants to give us that. Sometimes what happens, uh, I've heard of analogy before, like some little boys, nasty little boys that go knock on doors and run away. Man, we're not willing to wait for the answer. We're not willing to let God come. And we only go for a little bit. We feel pressure. Well, I've got to make a decision right now. Why? Where's the pressure for that coming from? Who's pressuring you? A spouse, a coworker, a friend, or God? You let the pressure come from him. You wait. Who cares? It is that important. We follow his instruction. We ask for it. We seek. We knock. And yes, we go through sometimes the hard thing of waiting, but God is delighted to give the answer. In fact, had they waited three days, this answer would have come to light on its own. Look in verse 15. So Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the rulers of the congregation swore to them. And it happened at the end of three days after they had made a covenant with them that they heard that they were their neighbors who dwelt near them. Man, if you could just wait. But I'm sure that would have been a lot of pressure. Joshua, what are we going to do? These men are, are here. You need to give them an answer. Hurry, Joshua. you got these other guys. It's fine. Just trust us. Nope. You let the pressure before you make a decision ultimately come from God. That Let that be the motivation before you do anything. I don't care who's pressuring you. You, you don't act too hastily. Uh, a lesson, an ancient pitfall for our day. I see a lesson for the young and unmarried today in our room or maybe watching online at some point. Because you know what's going to happen for the unmarried? God's plan for you is to get married the opposite sex. I know that's a crazy thing for our world today. Uh, The opposite sex. If you're a male, it's a female. If you're a female, it's a male. That's who God would have you to, to follow his blueprint for marriage, that you would commit in a covenant oath for life. But somewhere along the way, what happens, we look and we find that female or that male attractive. And then that person comes along and they say some really good stuff. In fact, you could even meet that person at church or a youth group, or a college ministry somewhere. And you think, man, this is all good. And then you know what the pitfall is? Other people come by and say, oh yeah, y'all be great together. Oh yeah, y'all, man, we can see the chemistry, it's clear. And then that person doesn't inquire the Lord. And then all the exterior looks fine, but did you know what? God has all the background information. He knows what that person, that man or woman is really saying is true. The background information is the heart, and he knows the depths of that person's heart. If they really have good intentions, if they're really wanting just to take advantage of you, if they're really wanting to just satisfy their own fleshly desires, but God loves you. Young people, please hear me to this. If you're unmarried, I don't care what age you are, listen to God. Go to him and you trust his guidance. I don't care what's coming out of their mouth. I don't care what they do at church. I don't care how much they serve. I don't care about any of that stuff. 
you trust what God brings to the light. And if you will wait, and if you will wait, God actually has a way in the waiting to expose things that we need to see. And if the thing's really true or not, God has a way of taking what's hidden in someone's tent and bringing it out. And even though they try to cover it up, they, they can't. And man, he can give you the counsel and the guidance you need. I don't know who are young people here. If you're, if you're here listening, man, you save this. I'm telling you, this could come into your, your life. And uh, Satan's got schemes to trip you up, but God's got a great plan if you will get the background information from him. I'll also tell you this, if you're going to say, well, I'll get married to that person, whatever oath that you make, oath in God's name is very serious. And you find that from this text. In fact, look with me in verse 18. It says, the children of Israel did not attack them because the rulers of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. And all the congregation complained against the rulers. Then all the rulers said to all the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. Now, therefore, we may not touch them. This we will do to them. We will let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath with which we swore to them. This is serious, making an oath. You see, they can't even attack them now, even though they want to, even though they found it, they've already made an oath in God's name. And they don't go back on it because that's serious. God was real to these people. And an oath in God's name today is still just as serious. And so let's just think about this for the Gibeonites. If you're a Gibeonite, you've heard of his fame, but now you're going to serve him. That's a terrible experience for somebody who really serves other gods. If you don't love the God of Israel, if you really have another God you worship, even if it's the God of your own self, and you're forced to, into forced labor for that, you, you'd probably rather just die. I mean, what, who would want to do that? For Joshua... Their oath that they would have to keep, not only could they not attack them, they are added weight that they are going to have to keep up with forever. Ultimately, until Saul is going to come and break this oath. That's a sermon for another day. But Joshua, this is added weight. In fact, look in chapter 10, verse 6. It says, And the men of Gimeon sent Joshua at the camp at Gilgal, saying, Do not forsake your servants. Come up to us quickly. Save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the mountains have gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So let me speak to this, what's going on. Joshua's good. They're just going to move on. All right, we can't hurt them. Let's go about our business. Let's go to the next in line. But then all the people hear that this treaty's been made. And so they're going to attack Gibeon. Gibeon cashes in on the deal. Cry out, Joshua, come save us. You know what Joshua's got to do because of this oath? He's got to come back. He's got to go deal with this. But let's just think about the sovereignty of God for a moment. This is actually the very case. We won't get into it. I'm taking too much of your time already. But where the sun stands still, the miracle that God gives to allow this battle to go further. Maybe someone in Gibeon sees that and says, you know what, Joshua's God's the real deal. God can certainly save that person. But for those who don't, you know what they are? They will be snares to the future children's children's children of the nation of Israel. Just as God had said. It is a big deal. These people would eventually become the snares that would trap them into sin. But God is sovereign over all of this. And God knows exactly how to keep us moving forward. Joshua is going to go on and continue to conquer the promised land. But these are ancient pitfalls that Satan will still drum up in our lives to get us to fall in today. And if we think we can't learn anything from any of that, we would be fools and we would think we would stand and ignore the warning. And then what's the next step? We would fall. There's much to be learned from those who have gone before us today. We're going to have a moment where we're going to apply this to our lives and have our last song. Do you have an example that you can learn from that's gone before you? Maybe even in your own life. Don't think that their pitfall could not be your own pitfall. A prideful heart thinks he can stand. A 
prideful heart thinks she can stand. But take heed, lest you fall. They're all around us today. And so maybe there's something you've walked in the room, and man, you need to acquire of God today. You've walked in, and there's something, but maybe you haven't even been asking him about. This is an opportunity for you. We'll have this last song for you. Man, I, I would be down here at the front. You could pray where you are, certainly. But I would be wherever you are inquiring of God and get before him and say, Lord, here's my situation. It looks this way. From what I can see in my observable information, it seems like there's nothing here that says this is not a good thing. What would you have me to do, Lord? And if you would inquire of God, I believe with all my heart, and you could take this to the Bible as well, he will give you the background information that you and I don't have. You realize we need that. Because all we can see is all we have to go off of. But we follow the God who sees it all. We follow and trust God who knows everything. Nothing has ever occurred to God. He is omniscient. And I believe he is delighted to give us counsel. No wonder Jesus told us to ask, seek, and knock for it. Do you have something you need to inquire of God today? I would be doing it. I would certainly would be. I wouldn't make a decision until I know that what I have is from the Lord, from his mouth. And then I will move forward. Maybe you need to wait. And that's, that's a hard thing to do, but I'll tell you it's always worth it. You trust him while you wait. And you keep knocking, you keep seeking until you get that answer. And you don't do anything till then. But I might be speaking to a group today like, I, I don't have nothing to inquire of today. I'm just, I'm just here, preacher. And that's absolutely fine. But you don't live long enough before you come across a decision. And maybe today you just want to make that commitment. Lord, keep me from this pitfall. Keep me from just relying upon human opinion or my own human perspective. Maybe today you would make that commitment. I hope that you would. That you don't think you couldn't fall into this at some point. And we need to remember God cares about the big and the little. Those little AIs, you still need to inquire of them. I want you and come and find just that wisdom and strength from Almighty God before you leave today for that next pitfall that you could avoid. Ancient pitfalls for the present age. We can learn from them and we can avoid them if we'll inquire of God today. Would you bow your heads? Let's go to him now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that you speak. Lord, we thank you that you give us all that we need to follow you. We thank you for the Bible. But Lord, it's not just the Bible. We have the Bible and we have prayer. May we apply both into our lives. May you guide us through your word, guide us in our prayer, that we would follow you in obedience. Lord, for some of us in this room, there might be something we need to confess. Would you give us the courage to do that? We thank you for 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We take comfort from the fact that men of God have gone before us and even though they have fall, they get back up and they keep moving and they keep walking. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you do that for us. If we have stumbled, may we just get it out before you today. Would you cleanse us of it and pick us back up so that we can finish our race that you've called us to? Would you move during this time, God, this moment, this invitation, Lord, would you speak powerfully into our hearts? Thank you for the forgiveness in Christ. So we have this last song. I invite you to stand to your feet. And maybe your decision today is you need to come and pray and inquire of the Lord. I invite you to come do that. But maybe today 
you've never inquired of God and the very first prayer you need to ask of him today is will he save you and if you don't know God you couldn't say I have a personal relationship with God your first prayer is to confess Jesus as Lord and that's how you get on the racetrack avoid the first pitfall of hell by humbling yourself and admitting to God that you're a sinner believing in Christ for what he has done in your life that he has paid the payment for you in full he was punished for your transgression he was nailed to a cross buried and on the third day risen again would you trust him today commit to obeying him and if that would be your decision today I invite you the moment we begin singing you just slip out from where you are you come meet me at the front but however God is moving today we have all had these pitfalls around us let's avoid them let's inquire of God would you do that would you take it seriously would you bring it all before the Lord whatever you have and give it to him as we sing won't you do that as we sing won't you come